So um, you've probably had, I know I did, I had this teacher in elementary school, and you probably did have this teacher that everybody knew they did not want to get, right? Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, that one teacher. And I had one in elementary school, and it was my third grade teacher, and she was known for, now, you younger kids, you probably heard your parents' stories, I'm sure, but she was known for her big paddle, right, and, and how hard she could paddle. That's what everybody would talk about, how when she would paddle, you did kind of, you know, kind of hop a little bit. I only got one of those from her, but, and I won't tell you why, because it's silly, but anyway, but she also had this really thick ruler that she would carry around, right, <laughs> and she'd take, did yours take, she took her hands and pull it back like that and just whap and just whack your hand. Now, I got a few of those. I even remember what that felt like, you know, but I, you know, we all had that. And it's, what are they trying to do? They're trying to, um, they're trying to modify your behavior, right? They're trying to get you to behave. Will you just behave, right? Will you just do something good for once in a while, you know? And this is ingrained, right? It's ingrained into our adulthood. What did we just do just about three weeks ago? It was New Year's, so we all made, well, made, yeah, resolutions, not all of us, you know. I know the word now was goals, right? We were making New Year's goals now, not resolutions, because they're going to work better, you know. <laughs> but so, but it is, it's all about modifying our behavior. And, you know, so it's ingrained in us, we, we keep doing this. Um, I know, like, eating healthier is way up there on those New Year's resolutions, Right. It's a huge one, and a few months ago, I decided, you know, I'm, I'm just eating too much sugar. I'm putting too much sugar in my body, so I cut out sodas for the most part. You know, I, if I go out to eat, I might have one or something like that, but, you know, I, I just started drinking, like, soda water and things like that, and then after my last doctor visit, and I was like, I need to cut out some more sugar. The numbers are going way the wrong way, and so I was like, you know, I'm going to, I, and I'm one of those people, as soon as I eat something savory, it's like, I gotta have something sweet right after it, you know. So I chew a lot of gum now, but it, and but you know, so I started doing that. Thanksgiving rolled around. I was real thirty minutes, and then boom, you crash, right? But it makes you feel good. And I know there's probably some of us in here who have that problem with with just overeating, and you, you've tried to change that behavior, and you just keep going back and forth and back and forth, you know, as you're trying to change. Or maybe some of you, it's debt, right? You just love to spend money, right? You come home to this about, you know, <laughs> once a week, you know, you got your Amazon package. You know the delivery person's name's kids, you know? Y'all are like, hey, how's Roger doing? Oh, he's great, you know? And y'all are having conversations. Y'all are like on a first name basis, you know? And maybe, or maybe for you, it's a car, you know? You got your car, you know, this one's paid for. You know, this one's fine. It runs fine, but this, it doesn't have the navigation. I was in my friend's car. They had the cool navigation. I could just plug in my phone, and there's the maps and all that stuff, and it tells you where to go. It tells you how to, you've seen the Buick commercials that parallel parks for you. I'm like, I don't know if I trust that or not, but I want that, you know. So you need a new one. Or you go to your friend's house. The big game is on, right? And they got the TV, and this is how you watch the game, right? You're right here. I mean, you're like, yes. You know, you have to run up and down the screen just to see what's happening. You know, and you're like, oh, I need a new TV, man, because, I mean, I can't see the, you know, the, the socks on. You know, I just, I, I got to have one. And so if I get a new TV, what does that mean? That means people are going to come over and look at this ratty furniture, so now i got to get some new furniture for people to sit on, right? And then like a sign from heaven comes down into your mailbox. And it's that rooms to go ad, right? No interest till, no payments till. And you're like, man, I can do this. You know, I can make these payments. If I just eat spaghetti three times a week, right? Three meals a week, spaghetti, maybe even one of them meatless. I don't have to do that. I just, you know, it's a $2 meal. I can make those payments, until your air conditioner goes out in your house, right? Because it always happens that way. And you have to swipe again. Swipe, swipe, swipe. And so you got this mountain of debt that's piling up behind you. 
And let me say this, just kind of, we have to, this is kind of a side note here. I think something that's really important, and I have to tell myself this a lot, is we need to remember or learn what the difference is between our needs and our wants, right? I have to tell myself, like, oh, man, I need a new shirt. No, I would like to have a new shirt, you know, whatever. But we need to tell a difference between those two. But maybe that's not your problem. Maybe you got your debt under control. You got your spending under control. Maybe for you, it's like everybody's gone to bed or everybody's going to bed. You're like, you know, I'll be up in just a minute. And so you get out your phone. You know that everybody's kind of turned out the lights. And you start going to those websites on your phone that you know you shouldn't be going to. You know, and you're like, you start justifying it after a while. And you're like, you know, I'm not hurting anybody else. It's not like I'm running around on anybody, you know. Or maybe... For you, you wake up one morning or, you know, a few mornings here and your, your throat's real scratchy, you know, and you're like, what is it? And you're like, oh, yeah, because you were yelling at your kids or yelling at your spouse. You know, that anger just welled up in you. You could just feel your whole head just bright red, you know, and you're like, and you've tried to stop these things. You know, we get ourselves in the situations we finally get to our point in our lives where we say, oh, that's enough, I've had it. So we start what? We start that next fad diet, you know, the keto or whatever it might be that's coming around. You know, we cut up our credit cards. We go to financial peace and are like, Dave Ramsey, Dave Ramsey. You know, we do all that. Or we put net nanny on all our devices. Or we start, you know, counting to 20 and putting breathing exercises, you know, when we're starting to get mad and angry at our family. And it's good for a while, right? You might make it for a little bit. Then all of a sudden, you're sitting there, you go to the kitchen, and somebody has put a dish in the sink when you have emptied and loaded the dishwasher. It's like they're, you know, and then all of a sudden, boom, you're angry again, and you're yelling again, right? You're getting after them again. Or you go to the store, and you go, and, um, they say, hey, you know, you, you've been out of debt for six months, right? You took the course, you got it down pat, and they're like, hey, if you sign up for our credit card today, you will get 20% off, right? You'll get 20% off of all your purchases. And like, you know, I, I can do that, right? I'll just, I'll just sign it up, and when it comes in, I'll just cut it up, and everything will be fine, you know, until it comes in. And you're like, well, maybe just one more thing. It, it'll be okay. Or, you know, you've got all, you know, you still got net nanny, it's working okay, but then you got all the streaming services and you know how to delete the history of what you watched on those things. Or you're doing really good, eating healthy, and then all of a sudden the stress comes back and starts to pile on you and you, and you get right back into your old eating habits or the holidays like me. And you ask yourself, well, you're like, why can't I win this battle? This one thing that's got the grip on me, what is happening? And it's because, I believe it's because we have been told that behavior modification is the key to living a good and righteous life. And if we can just modify our behavior, then we will be a good person or a good Christian. We wrongly believe that if we stop doing wrong things and start doing right things, our lives will be better. We will be better people, or at least look that way on the outside so people will think that we have our act together. You know, you'll go out to lunch today, and, you're, and you're, you'll be nice to your servers, and you'll tip them well. You'll let people in your lane, even if they, even if they saw the sign a mile back, the lane is closing, you're going, I'll be nice today, I'll let you in, you know, that kind of thing. You'll sm smile at the Walmart cashiers, what Walmart cashiers? Well, you'll smile when you go to, you know, the self-checkout. You'll smile at the person watching over that. And those are all good things. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. We need more kindness in the world. Absolutely. But those things that have a white-knuckled grip on your life, they still never seem to change, no matter how much that you change your behavior. So we... We try to modify our behavior more and more. I was like, all right, here I go. I'm going to really get down and dirty with this. But the problem is this. Behavior modification 
deals only with what is on the surface. It does not remove the root of your problem. Think about it. If you're mowing your grass, right? You mow your grass, you got the perfect lines, you know. You do that dad thing where you, you get done and you're like, you know, you, you get that pose. You know, you're looking at your yard and it's awesome and everything is just, you just, you know, you just sharpen your blades and it's just perfect, you know. Three days later, you walk out to your car and all of a sudden what pops up? The weeds, right? The little dandelions, the weeds and all that, they start popping up. You're like, man, I got to go mow my grass again. So you go back out there and you mow your grass again. But you could have gone out there and pulled up your weeds, right? So what's that? I can't hear you. They're for the bunnies and the bees. And I hear what the humans could eat them too. <laughs> well, maybe some other kind of weeds. You can keep your dandelions. That's fine. But anyway, so you've mowed it, but you, or maybe your flower garden, right? The weeds start popping up. You want to get out there so to check your flowers. But anyway, the point is you want to get out there and you want to take care of your weeds. And the same thing in your life, right? So rather than looking at how to stop doing bad things and start doing good things, we need to look at what's wrong in our hearts that's causing those bad things to happen and dig it up from the roots. So if you've been a Christian for a while, you, pro I'm, you, you know the fruits of the Spirit, right? I mean, if you, and if you don't, if you're, not, if you're not quite sure what that is, it's like this list of qualities in the Bible that a Christian should have, exude, you know, show other people if they are allowing the Holy Spirit to direct their life. But here's the deal. Anyone, anyone, even someone who does not believe in God can act or even pretend to be loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, all those things, gentle, gentleness and have self-control, even for a short time at least, right? They, you know, anybody can do that. So instead of behavior modification, what we want it's transformation. We want transformation. Why? Because behavior modification is when we try to stop the patterns of destruction in our lives by changing what we do. But transformation is when we change the reason. We change the reason for the patterns of destruction in our lives. And the result is it changes what we do. It transforms you to where these qualities, those fruits of the spirits, they are who you are. They're who you are and not just what you do. Behavior modification, it is a very poor substitute for transformation. With transformation, you'll be able to look at these fruits of the Spirit and you'll be able to say, I am these things, right? Hannah is kind, patient. You put your name behind that. I am these things. And because when you allow the Holy Spirit to transform your heart, it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit that will be produced in you. And that is who you will be. That's who the world will see, your neighbors and your family and your friends. So let's look in our Bibles. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to go to the book of Matthew Chapter 23, it'll still be up on the screen. Matthew chapter 23, I'm going to start in verse 25, and I'll be reading from the ESV version a lot today if you're on your, if you have your um, app, if you want to bring up your app. If you're not familiar with the Bible, and that's okay, I know some people not, it's the, it's the first book of the New Testament. <clears throat> and here we have Jesus speaking. He has just had this, just previously you should see the story. He just had a conversation with the Pharisees, you know, the religious leaders of the day. And he, he finally, they finally got to just where at this point they were like, he, he shut them down so many times that they were like, they dared not ask him any more questions after this. And so he had just had this conversation before and they were, they were for once in their life, they were speechless. Okay. So now they're just kind of huddled over together over here, just kind of wondering what's next. So Jesus decided he's going to give a little bit more insight to the Pharisees and to their heart. 
And so now we're called, we're in this section of the scripture that's called what, what a lot of people call the seven woes. The seven woes that, that, directs, uh, that directs about the lives of the Pharisees, that's directed towards them. And also the scribes, you'll see that word in there. Scribes is not just somebody who writes something now like we think. It's like an expert in the law. And so let's talk about this one word. Let's talk about woe. Let's talk about the word woe, okay? That's the wrong word woe. We're not talking about that woe. We're talking about W-O-E woe. Woe. We're talking about this. It's a primary exclamation of grief of bitter grief, you know, it's also condemnation as well, but there's a lot of grief, and I almost think of it as, like, man, how pitiful for you, almost, I feel so sorry for you, kind of thing, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence, the Message Bible puts it this way, the insides are maggoty, with your greed and gluttony. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. You see, the Pharisees taught the importance of being ritually clean, and they observed and taught other people the dietary and cleansing ordinances of the law. And it was all about the religion. It was all about the religion to them. But they neglected to what was happening on the inside. They were neglecting their hearts. And they were consumed by the external appearances and the rituals that they had. And honestly, we can do, still do that kind of thing today. You know, we go Saturday night, we get our car washed, we make sure the comb over is covering all the bald spots. You know, all the girls have the matching dresses and everything. And there is nothing Zero wrong with that. It's okay to look nice. There's nothing wrong. There's no, I mean, my car, I'm so glad it rained because I parked my car under a tree. And so you imagine every time, I mean, I'll go wash my car a day later. It's just, you know, the birds. And so, I'm, you know, it's okay to have these things. But I like the way Pastor Tony Evans puts it. He says this. He says, when your chief concern is being seen and accepted by men, You'll concentrate on making a good outward impression while ignoring the corruption inside of you. Like that sleazy businessman that you see on all the TV shows and all the movies with the slick back hair. And man, he's just, he's got everything together with his clothes. You know, he knows exactly how to set, what, what to say. But he, you know, you can tell as soon as they put him on the screen, he's just rotten on the inside. We must pay attention to what's going in our heart first. So look at verse 26 again. Jesus says, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate so the outside will be clean. Now you think about this for a second. If you go home and you get a cup and you clean the inside, is it automatically going to make the outside clean? No. But that's how powerful the heart is. That's how, how much your heart affects what you do. And God knows that when our heart is right, that our behavior is going to follow. And that's why we need transformation of the heart before we can expect a true transformation of what is going to be happening with our behavior. Remember, going back to this, transformation is when we change the reason for the patterns of destruction in our lives. And then the result is that it's going to change what we do. Transformation says, well, it's like, why do I overeat? Transformation says, I eat like this because something horrible happened to me when I was a child. And I'm trying to cover up that pain. Why do I continuously go in debt? Transformation says, because I didn't have enough, a lot of money when I was growing up, and it always embarrassed me. Why do I turn to porn? Transformation says, because maybe my, my father wasn't around, or maybe I was teased by girls when I was, in, you know, when I was a young kid, and I still feel that, that anguish and pain. Why do I continue to yell at my kids? Transformation says, because you were abused by your mother when you were young. Our unwanted behavior 
is the sign, is the sign that something needs to change in us from the inside. Maybe you've had success by stopping some bad, bad behaviors just by pure will. You know, but there's a problem. You are still living with that void. You're still living with the hurt and the pain and that emptiness that just sits right here. And then there's going to be a good chance you're going to try to numb that pain with something else. But we have good news. We have good news. God wants us, God wants to heal our hearts. He doesn't want, want you walking around like this. He wants to heal your heart. He wants to take that pain and transform it into good. The moment we become a Christian is when it happens, and that, that's when he wants to just take that and just transform your heart. And I think just sometimes we need to be reminded, reminded of who we are, the child of God, and then what happens to us in the light of his resurrection. I'm going to look at a few verses. The first, first few are written by Paul, the last one, John. So we're going to look in Philippians, and it's going to be chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 8. Philippians 3, verse 8. Paul says this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, all those things in my past, I count them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, those religious things that we hang on to, but that which comes through faith, this, you're going to hear this word a lot, faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and I may share his sufferings, becoming like him in death. So our old life, it has died like Christ died, so that we could be res re resurrected in the power of his resurrection. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in what? In newness of life. Newness of life is what we have. The old life is gone. We are supposed to walk in newness of life with Christ. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you're a Christian, you have died with Christ. And like Christ was brought back to life, you were brought back to life. That newness of life. The old, the old you is dead. And now you have this new you. Living with Christ and the Holy Spirit. 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Don't you want to overcome the world? And this is the victory. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Here it is again. Our faith. Our faith is what overcomes the world. It is the victory that we have. Verse 5, Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? These scriptures, they talk about new and resurrected and Christ living in me. And when you become a Christian, you start your journey as a new creation into a new life. You have been resurrected from an old life that leads to death to a new life of Christ in you. 
But what happens is that we believe that if we stop doing wrong things, that behavior modification, and we start doing right things, then life will be good. But we have to remember that behavior modification is a poor substitute for transformation. So when we see that our behavior needs to change, and we know that our hearts are the things that need to be transformed, then what do we do about that? Well, first, you have to humble yourself. You have to be, you gotta be humble. And you gotta realize that your life here is never going to be complete. That you have to go to the source. You know, you, me, Pastor Bill, we, we're all growing, we're all learning, and we're all learning how to trust our Heavenly Father more and more and day after day. And we go to the source of the one, one who can transform our hearts. And you also got to get rid of the religious burdens. Go look at Matthew chapter 11, verse, starting verse 28. Jesus speaking, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You take my yoke upon you. Think about that, the yoke that, you know, the two oxen are next to each other. That means you're walking. Here's, there's Jesus right there next to you, walking with you. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me right here. Learn from me. I am gentle, lowly in heart, and you will find rest. You're going to find rest for your souls. Your souls will be at rest. My for my yoke is easy, and my burden, those burdens of always trying to impress others, always and try to impress people in your church, all those burdens. And my burden is light, is what he says. You've got to break free from those things. You've got to break free from trying to put on a show. So how do we do that? There's this word commune, right? And it's not a word. We don't, we don't talk about that. I'm going to go to Bill's house, and we're going to commune. You know, we don't say that nowadays right it's this word and it means to you know where we want to get to know him and it means this it says share one's intimate thoughts or feelings with so you want to commune with God you want to share your intimate thoughts and your feelings the things that have happened today to you or this week and, and share it with you share it with him Let, you know and it's not because he he already knows right but it's this relationship that we're supposed to have with Him. And I cannot stress enough how much your relationship with your Heavenly Father, how much that means and how important it is, that relationship, how healthy it is, that you have that healthy relationship with your Heavenly Father. He is the perfect Father. I mean, it's not, not tithing, not coming to church every Sunday, you know, not saying a prayer before every meal, you know. I love the ones the preschool does. I don't remember. Thank you, God, for giving us food. Something like that. I hear that every day, and it's just awesome. I love it. And those are great things. There is nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying, you, you know, it, it's just where it comes from, right? It's the why behind you're doing these things. Because when your relationship with your Heavenly Father is healthy, then those things are going to come out of a place of love for Him. Love for Him. And not out of religious obligations. Let me say that again. Whenever you have a healthy relationship with your Heavenly Father, all these things will come out. Out of a love for Him. And that's why. So I know a lot of you are like the list, you know, what's well, my practical? You're just waiting. You know? So we have, we have some practical steps of ways to get closer to God. And this comes from a book that I had in seminary. Uh, Donald Whitney, he wrote this, and it's called Spiritual Disciplines for Christian Life. And these are not going to be surprising, you know. I mean, I think most of you are going to go, oh, yeah, I get that, sure. You know, but I think a lot of times we just need to be reminded. You know, we need to, we need to, oh yeah, right? Because we got the world against us, you know? We got the enemy against us. Satan doesn't want you to do these things. And so we have to be reminded, you know? You're always, it's always that push. You got to lean into God, lean into Him. 
sometimes and just, you know, so we need to be reminded. So the first thing is this, and I love the way he says this, Bible intake. Bible intake. It's not just reading. You know, I think a lot of people hear that, you know, read your Bible more, read your Bible every day. It's an intake, you know, it's like the source of what you need. So you're, you're, you know, like food, you intake your food, you know, it's that spiritual nutrition you need, Bible intake. The second one, of course, is prayer, you know. Like I said, these are not going to be surprising. You're not going to be, oh. But, I mean, prayer, you, you pray every day. And I know some of you, maybe you haven't prayed in a while. You're like, man, it's just, it's just so hard to get started. I don't even know where to start. One thing that I was told a while back is like, you know, if you don't know where to start, start with the Lord's Prayer. But not, don't just rattle it off, right? What you want to do is you say, you say, you start at the beginning. You say, our God in heaven. Oh, God, my God in heaven. And do you think about my Father? Right? Our Father who art in heaven. And you think about the Father in the heaven and how, how great He is, but also how intimate He is at the same time. Hallowed be Your name. How great is Your name, Lord? You just start with those things. How great is Your name? I just worship You. So you start with who He is. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Oh, Lord, I just pray that the things that I do in my life, that it gives You glory, God. And so if you're having trouble just starting, to just start with that. Just keep breaking it down. And you'll find yourself just worshiping the Lord and pouring your heart out to Him. The third thing is worship. Worship, your individual worship. Make somebody laugh at you in the car while you're going down because you're just, wow, oh, praise it. You know, you've got the Christian music on when you're going to work. Now look, I love 80s rock music just as much as anybody my age loves it, okay? I do. But there are some, and sometimes I'll listen to that, you know, just because that, that nostalgia gets in. But there are times that I can, I can just feel it. I'm like, I've got to put on some worship music right now. And even there's times I don't even want to. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, it's, it sounds all the same sometimes, you know. And honestly, and I live with it, right? I'm, you know, if you're new here, I'm usually the one up here uh, leading worship. So I hear it all the time. I'm, I'm constantly listening for new songs for us to sing and stuff here. And I'm like, oh, fine. And I'll, I'll find my Apple playlist and put it on. And, and then all of a sudden, by the second or third song, Man, my heart is just is tender towards God and then and the things he has to say to me and I'm worshiping. And then corporately here too, as you, as we're able to gather, let us never take that for granted. Right? Think about so many places in the world where they cannot do what we are doing here today. Let's not take that for granted, people. I pray that every Sunday. Lord, help me not take this for granted. That we can come here and be together as a church body, as a church family, and come and worship the Lord together. The third thing is evangelism. And as soon as I said that word, all the introverts went, no, you know, <laughs> evangelism. But look, it's not, you know, it's not just street evangelism, okay? There was this guy I knew in Florida. He was great. He could just walk up. I, I went with him one day. And I'm a very shy, introverted person. And he, he would walk up to anybody. And he got shot down, shot down, shot down. I don't know how many times. And he just walked it off. You know, he, it's like, man, how does he do this? And then this one person, right, this one, this one girl he talked to, he started you know, saying something to her. And it just, something just clicked in her. And he sat down and prayed with her. But I'm not talking just about that, right? Some people are gifted in that area. But sometimes it's just sharing your story with your friends and your family, people you already know, something, somebody you've built a relationship with. And maybe they're the ones that bring up religion. And you're like, there it is. There's my door, right? And you just, you just have a conversation with that person. And there's something about sharing your story that reminds you of what God did for you. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. Because sometimes we get in the rut, you know. Sometimes we get in the rut of our lives. 
And then it's like, that's right. I remember now. It's come, you know, that God's, the way God saved me from these things. And the way that I, I just, living for God every day, just, uh, just, I can't even hardly describe it the way it feels. Number five is serving. Number five is serving. And as a pastor, you know I got to say kids ministry, but no, it's just, <laughs> but Marion's like, yes, kids ministry. But it's not just kids ministry, even though that would be great, you know. Um, just serve, even serving your neighbor, serving the people that don't even know God, you know, serving or, or serving in here, serving at your church, of course. Serving the people, I don't know, just, just little things. You could probably think of a few ways that you could serve your family and your friends and even people that you don't even know that well. Showing them the love of Christ. Number six is stewardship. Stewardship, and I know a lot of people, oh, well, you know, that's money. Here we go again. But it's not just that God has, you know, the time also that you have. You know, God has allotted you this time here on earth, and we should use it wisely, you know. I'm, it's, it's one of the things I struggle with, honestly. I, I struggle with laziness. I really do. Man, it's, it's, it's easy for me to be like, oh, I got time. You know, procrastination and laziness is, is something I, I continue to have to pray over in my life. But I want to be a good steward of my time, and I want to make sure that everything that I do gives God glory, even the rest. Even rest, right? We're supposed to rest. You know, we're supposed to do that. We need rest for our bodies. We need, and then we need to spend time with our families. That's important, too. And God knows how important that is. The next thing we don't, we don't really talk about a lot is fasting. Fasting, I think of fasting as like the fast track, the fast track to this spiritual thing going on in your life. And I know there's probably some of you in here that it's like you can't medically, you know, fast, that you, you know, you would actually die if you, I mean, seriously. But you can think of other ways to creatively fast. And there's something about fasting that when you do it and you're like, and you're reminded of who the source is in your life. You know, who's the one that provides for you? You feel that little bit of hunger, pain, and it's like, I'm going to worship right now. I'm pumping gas, but I'll just close my eyes and I'll pretend that I just don't want to see how much this is going to cost. You know, but I mean, I'm just, I need to worship God. I need to give him glory right now because he is the source and he is my provider. Number eight, silence and solitude. And all the young moms in here are like, yes, that's the one right there. Could I go to the bathroom and I see little fingers like this? What you doing, you know? Or a little eyeball, you know, what's going on in there, right? You're like, silence and solitude. But there's something about this that you get, you're able to get alone with God, right? And you're able, you talk, they talk about the prayer closet. And you're able to get alone with him. And you're able to listen. That's the thing, right? You pray and you listen to what he has to say to you. Number nine is journaling. Why is journaling important? It's because you can go back and look and see what God has done in your life. If you start journaling now, in like a year or two, you can go back. I want to see, you know, Janu what was I praying about in January 2023? I can't believe it's 2023. But I want to see, and you look and you say, God answered that prayer. I, for I even forgot I prayed that, and God answered that prayer for me. And that draws you closer to the heart of God. And the last thing is learning. Learning. You pray for a hunger for God's word and what it has to say. You want to learn. We have Bible classes that, that have started up on Wednesday nights. You know, a Pastor Bill's going through Romans. Just, you know, bit by bit. And, we, and we, so you just want to dig. It's like digging deeper into God's word. Now look. This probably looks very overwhelming right now. Don't eat the elephant whole, right? You've heard that. How do you eat an elephant, right? A piece at a time. That's right. You know, start with one. Just one a month. You probably, a lot of you probably already do number one and two. 
Let's start, you know, start with one. If you do one a month, if you make one a month a habit, before the end of the year, you'll have all ten. You know? So don't, just do it a little bit of, just a piece at a time. And I'm sure that prayer is probably, you're already praying, or prayer might be on the top of your list for, you know, you maybe circled that one. It is very important that you be able to be with God and to pray and I, what I'm saying is during your time of prayer, like we were talking about before, when you have, you're, you're talking about the transformation of your heart. So these behaviors can be modified. And you're talking about the reason why. Go to God. Say, Lord, my Father, can you show me something in my past that hurts, that hurt me, that something that happened to me and this is why I have this behavior. And this is why I cannot let go of this behavior that I have. I know it's going to hurt when you show it to me. When you bring it to my mind. But Lord, I just pray. I, 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 I need to lay it at your feet, God. I need to lay it at your feet. You are the one that can transform my heart, Lord. And so I pray, God, that you just show this to me. And I, I had something just, just a, I was, when I was working on this message, I tell you, anytime I, I work on a message, I'm preaching to myself all week long. You know, I have, um, there was something that happened when I was probably 11 or 12 years old. Uh, Lord, show me something. There, you know, there's something, you know, that, uh, a reason why I'm, I'm hanging on to this certain thing. And he says, well, one of the things is this. And this memory popped up. And it's just a very, it was a very small, it wasn't even, I mean, it didn't seem significant. But apparently it was very significant because every time I thought about this 10 second thing that happened in my life, I could feel that pain and that hurt and everything all over again. And the embarrassment, all that, just, just, 10 little seconds of my whole almost 50 year old life would just bring it right back from when I was like 11. And I was finally like, you know, I, it's, I'm going to let it go. Lord, I give this to you and I'm going to forgive this person. And now, I mean, ever since that happened, I think of that memory and I'm like, <laughs> it's almost, I can't believe I let that sit for so long. Because it was just such a little thing. Now, there might be some things in your life that might be a little more complicated than that. I know there's people in here that you have some things that are a little more complicated. They're bigger things. And it's almost like there's going to be like layers and layers and layers of stuff that you've got to peel off. You ever, the, the Narnia books, I think, am I right? where he's peeling off the scales, you know, and, and that's what it's going to feel like. It's actually going to hurt a little bit. But that's, you know, that's when you find you have that good friend that you know that you can talk to about this or a, a pastor or if maybe it's even bigger and you're like, I need to, you know, I just can't. There's just some things I just feel like I can't get out even with the, the people I know here. And you find a, a, a good Christian therapist, someone who's going to pray for you after you've had your session. There is no shame, no shame in that, okay? If that's something that you just need to be able to, to, to unpack something that happened, it's okay. And then you can let it go and you can lay it at the feet of God. So at this time, if you'll stand, and I want you to take this time. Now, we're going to have a time of prayer. And I want you to pray during this time, Lord, if there is some kind of hurt I'm hanging on to, Father God, I just want to give it to you right now. For Father God, let's pray. Lord God, there's just this thing that I've been hanging on to for so long in my life, Lord. And right now, I just want to give it to you. I want to lay it at your feet. And even if, even if I can't just let it go right now, Lord, I pray that you give me the strength and you give me the wisdom to know how to give this up, Lord. Even if I have to peel it off a layer at a time, that I'm going to still lay this at your feet today. 
I'm going to lay it at your feet today, Lord, and I'm just going to give it to you so that any kind of behavior that I want to change in my life, Lord, that you will transform my heart so I can let those behaviors go. So right now, we're going to open up the altar. And if anybody wants to come and pray, you're welcome to come and pray up here. You can just pray at your seat. And we're going to sing a song. And we're going to worship together. And we're just going to pour our hearts out to the Lord this morning. And we're going to give Him the glory, God. And we're going to lay these things at His feet. So right now, if you would like, you're welcome to come up to the altar. And we are going to sing and pray and worship the Lord together this morning.